Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, my wife and I have been married now as of, I guess, last Tuesday, it's 42 years, and uh, for the first three she drank pretty heavily. I did too. I had a rock and roll band called Whiskey, and our motto was "Boogie till you puke," and that was pretty much pretty much what we did. And uh, but then she got pregnant with her first son, and she quit drinking. And she went to an AA meeting, just one, and uh, she came home and said, "I'm never going to that again." And they were trying to shove God down my throat. They told me I'd just have to divorce you. And uh, anyway, she didn't go to AA, but she didn't drink for, I was trying to figure it out, and I think about 25 years, except a couple times in the middle, she decided we had people over and she decided she could have a beer or a glass of wine. And both times that happened, she ended up at the doctor because she just, in two days, drank herself sick. And, and then she didn't drink again until our youngest son went off to college, which was now 16 years ago. And she, we went to a wedding, and she said, I think uh, I'm going to have a glass of champagne. I said, uh, okay. And it pretty much started there, and she picked right up where she'd left off and uh, kind of put the pedal to the metal. And I am a fully certified Al-Anon and an enabler of the first degree. For the whole time that she didn't drink in the middle, even though she wasn't drinking, we still had an awful lot of tension in our family. We still had all the isms that go along with alcoholism and with Al-Anonism. And, uh, you know, I spent all that time trying to interdict in between her and the kids and trying to avoid anything that might cause problems or have her get angry and or, or cause any conflict. I hated conflict, always hated conflict, you know. And I'd lie awake at night trying to figure out, well, what's the next thing that could possibly happen and how can I possibly avoid it and what steps do I need to take, you know. And most of the time, those things that I was worried about never happened. But sometimes they did, and sometimes it was something completely unexpected. But I had pretty much created a a world. I think somebody was talking about, you know, the craziness in their brain, and I had created this world where I was fully occupied with just avoiding conflict, avoiding problems, and and uh, trying to pacify and and. Uh, it was, you know, there's a place in the big book where it talks about resentments. Well, I had at least a few. I had an awful lot of anger, and I never, ever expressed that anger outwardly. I always just internalized it. So I walked around with a big pit in my stomach all the time. If I woke up in the middle of the night, I couldn't go back to sleep. If I, A lot of times I couldn't go to sleep. If I woke up early, I was awake. And, and I just... Uh, no, I didn't really think anything of it because it was just the way it was. We went on with our lives. She worked, I worked, you know. And we never had real... Uh, she wasn't drinking, you know, but life was still really hard. And, and then about 10 years ago, I guess, let me get to the little enabling part. When she started drinking, she decided she was going to smoke, too, and she wouldn't do that in the house. And... and uh, so I set up a little area out in the garage for her. I had a table, a TV, a heater, and a big refrigerator full of beer right next to it. And she always had a, a lot of homework she had to do at night. And uh, so she'd just sit out there and smoke and drink until she fell asleep or passed out or came in or whatever. But she had to get up the next morning. And I sat inside with the dog and 
And actually those 10 years for me in some ways were easier because she wasn't on my back and I wasn't having to worry about her every second, at least from the time that she got home and went to the garage and the time I got up the next morning. You know, but every morning I was getting up early and making her lunch so she'd be ready to go because she was pretty much always hungover. And if I didn't get it ready, she wouldn't need any lunch, you know. And But resenting every stroke of the knife across the bread and making sure peanut butter went all the way to the edge. And <laughs> the, the jelly went all the way to the edge so there could be no confusion. And I also had to scrape it back a little bit so when she took the first bite, she didn't get a draw up on her clothes, you know. And I don't know, I, and I just, the resentment was, I guess, eating me up, and I didn't really know it. And about six years before she quit drinking, I was walking the dog, and I felt funny, and I went to the doctor, and he did an EKG, and he said, it looks fine, but I think we're going to send you to a car cardiologist. Anyway, they sent me down there, and she put me on the treadmill and said, stop. And then they took me into surgery the next day and put a stent in my heart. And they said, have you, do you have any stress in your life? You know, your blood, <laughs> your blood pressure is great. Your, you know, you don't have, your cholesterol is great. You know, and I go, I don't think so. I'm a builder, and it was 2008 or something like that. And the bottom had just fallen out, but I wasn't really stressed out about it, I didn't think. And uh, then three years later, I got another one. And uh, that was the spring before she decided to put herself in detox. And she put herself in detox, and uh, then she went into inpatient up at uh, Monroe. And I went there for the family nights, you know, and when she was in there, I was freaking out because for the last 25 years, you know, I knew what my place was. I had to plan all this stuff and avoid all this stuff and make sure she had her lunch and all that, you know, and... I was frightened, and I was really scared, and and uh, anyway, when she got back, or before she came home, she said, I, I drank beer, I smoked some pot, I usually took a couple bong hits before I went to bed at night so I could sleep, and she said, in order for me to come home, I have to have everything out of the house, otherwise I have to go to a halfway house, and I had told her before, you know, I'll quit, if you want me to quit, I'll quit. And so I told her, I'll quit and I'll get rid of everything. And I did. And so when she got home, you know, I thought, oh, great. Everything's going to be great. You know, we're going to have long walks on the beach and hold hands. And it'll just be this idyllic marriage that we've dreamt of all these years, you know. And it wasn't like that for some reason. No, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that either. No, I don't want to hold your hand, you know. And... uh I was freaking out, but she was also an outpatient um, program by then, and and she said, you know, there's an Al-Anon meeting just down the hall that might help you. And when I'd went to family nights at her inpatient, I'd met a woman there, and she, uh, her son had tried to hang himself a couple times. He was an alcoholic. And, and uh, the first couple times I saw her at family night, she was just a wreck. She was just sobbing. And uh, then the third night, she was a lot better. And I said, what happened? And she goes, well, I went to an Al-Anon meeting. And I went, wow, you know, it looks like it really helped. And she gave me my first one, but one day at a time. And uh, that was my first exposure. And so then that next, the first Friday after she got out, I went to my first Al-Anon meeting, and that was right at the recovery center, and I walked in the door, and Larry was there, and he said, you're right where you need to be. <laughs> and, you know, and I walked in, and I felt safe, and I felt, I listened to the stories that the people told me, and I knew that, you know, I wasn't alone, and, you know, the next thing he said is, I've got somebody I want you to meet, you know, and my home group's out here, and courage to change on the island and so I went to that first meeting and and uh, I don't think my sponsor was there at the first meeting I'm not sure I think maybe you were thought maybe you're in Denver but anyway I got a sponsor right away 
and uh, it was really good for me. We started on the big book. I worked the 12 steps, you know, and doing the fourth step and the fifth step, and I was really lucky I had a sponsor who kept me moving, you know. And I didn't have any kind of bright light spiritual awakening, you know, when I asked God to remove all of my defects of character. But uh, I felt a lot lighter, you know, and I went from being a real introverted person who didn't want to talk to anybody to somebody who could look people in the eye and, and talk to them. And I learned to be really honest about myself and with other people. And, uh, you know, it's been six years since that happened, and my wife didn't go to AE for quite a bit of it. She was not very happy that I was going to a Al-Anon. She goes, AE is supposed to be my thing. Now you're going to Al-Anon, and you're the Al-Anon star, you know, because I, I was doing service and doing the things that were recommended for me, you know. And, and even today, she was, uh, you know, well, what time do you have to go? And I told her, well, I wanted to leave about 2, and she gets home so and says, you don't have to leave till like 4.45, right? And I go, no, I need to leave now. And she goes, you told me 4.45. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> things are a lot better. She is, does have a sponsor now, you know, and she started going to meetings again since COVID ended. And a few times, you know, she's said something to me, and she's looked at me and went, I'm sorry I said that. And it was not something that happened for the last 30 years. So one thing I think that's good about me being an Al-Anon is, you know, kind of frustrated her and she goes, well, I'm going to go. So, and she did, you know, and so it's working for me and I think it's helping us both. So thank you. Ten minutes about. <laughs> we have a timer at our meeting for Don and me. <laughs> we should be adapted to five minutes by now. Anyway, uh, now I get to introduce uh, Helen Gannon, my wife of forty years. Who gets to introduce Ellen Cassidy? Yes, that's my job. Who? <laughs> well, you have forty years, also. It's a big forty-year deal. <laughs> oh, you just did, you just introduced her. Thanks. No, I'm just kidding. Whatever. It's forty years. We're still renegotiating the contract. <laughs> Whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, Al-Anon, like AA, is an anonymous program, which I have a dilemma tonight because tonight's speaker is a rock star in Al-Anon, <laughs> in an anonymous program. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, so, it, and I, and I wanted, I told her, I said, I'm going to make it a little longer. I hope that's okay with you because I want to be a little serious about this. Um, we met uh, Ellen in person 10 years ago when we were in Ocean Shores, and my sponsor and I um, and got to pick her up from the airport, her and her husband Richard, and drive to Ocean Shores with her, and we just loved it, just loved it. And, um, and so we went to the airport the other day, and, and we got to catch up on the last 10 years. And um, I've been thinking about this. We came into Al-Anon, Larry and I came into Al-Anon because um, our, our home was a war zone. We were in a battle for our son, for his life. And, um, and we, when we came into the program, we worked it like our lives depended on it because they did. And things got better. Things got a lot better. Our son would 
answer when we called him. He would invite us over to his house. He told us where he lived sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and you know, life was life was pretty good. And it was it's easy to work the program when life's good. You know, we got busy service commitments, sponsoring, uh, and you know, alas, um, Al-Anon does not promise puppies, rainbows, and unicorns, because life happens, and the bottom fell out of our world on May 7th, 2012, and our son lost his battle to his uh, his addiction, alcohol and drugs, and, um, and, and it's hard to work the program when these things happen, you know? It's darn hard to work the program when these things happen. But um, but we've been in long enough where we, um, you know, we're told to carry the message, and that's what we do. Well, after we lost our son, the message and the messengers carried us until we could stand on our own two feet again, and thank you for that. Um, Northwest Watts is a big part of that. We needed to be here. And um, tonight's speaker, her message is in my heart. Um, she carries a message that has depth and weight and love and hope and grace. And I hope you will join me in welcoming Ellen C. <laughs> Pay no attention. <laughs> what was that? No attention. You're doing good. <laughs> love okay. them. Love them. Love them. My name is Ellen and I'm an enthusiastic, boundlessly grateful Alan on. Hello, my friends. Ugh, you make me want to cry already. I just got here. Um, I don't normally come to conferences on Thursdays. But I did come 10 years ago when these were my hosts back then, fell in love with them back then. And when she said, will you come, Larry, will you come on Thursday? I went, yep. <laughs> yep, I'll be there. I don't want to miss a minute of it. And I'll tell you something, it's better. It's better. I don't know. Maybe it's me. Often it is me. But um, I've been moved to tears a couple of times today by the shares in the meetings, as much by the impromptu people getting up and speaking as the people who were who were um, up here to do it. I mean, the spirit in here is palpable, palpable. The fact that Alan and I do a little thing with some of my sponsees at night. We share three gratitudes and one evidence of God every day. And um, my evidence of God tonight was this conference was what happened this day and the way Al-Anon is respected in this room. Don't feel like stepchildren. Don't feel like Al-Anon who. Um, that the family recovery is as respected as uh, uh, it doesn't happen anyplace else. I've been in several thoughts places and this is still my favorite. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for today and I can hardly wait for tomorrow. Uh, actually, I'm looking forward to about 9.30. <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank you, committee, for all that you've done. And thank you for that fabulous basket. It was a bag. It was a bag of a lot of things. I just can't even begin to tell you. Most of it food. And um, the bottom was um, uh, mints. <laughs> I could just stay in my room. But I, I, don't, I would miss you if I did that. Um, I introduced myself as an al -Anon. I always want to explain that that's not good news. Explaining things is how I got to al -Anon. <laughs> I always thought if I could get you to listen long enough, then you'd understand. You'd see the way. And you would say the magic words, oh, you're right. <laughs> Never works. <laughs> Not when you love alcoholics. It doesn't work. It never works. But you know what? God has found a use for even my, my biggest defects. Uh, and he's found a use for this explaining muscle. He's, and he said to me one day, he said, Precious, you have worked that explaining muscle up. And I'm going to send you out to little pockets of people all over and just let you explain your heart out. <laughs> 
in today's your, I mean, tonight's your night in the barrel. I'm used to speaking in the daytime. <laughs> tonight's your night in the barrel. Um, I, I'm going to explain about being an Al-Anon. Al-Anon is not what I wanted to be when I grew up. I didn't know there was such a thing. I'm not sure there was. There wasn't such a thing, actually, as Al-Anon to be. I was about 10 years old when there came such a thing as Al-Anon. And uh, I didn't want to be an Al-Anon when I got here. I didn't, uh, I just came for the the, the trick. You, you just teach me how it is, you get them sober, I'll do it, and we'll go home. It'll all be good. Um, uh, and when I came to Al-Anon, I didn't have very many opinions. I either had yours or the opposite of yours, depending on what I wanted you to do. Today, I have strong opinions about people being called Al-Anon. I'm not an Al-Anon because I love an alcoholic. I have such news for you. I love all the alcoholics. <laughs> it's, it used to be a curse. Now I just take, good look, God puts me in rooms full of alcoholics. It's, it's heaven. It's just heaven. So I, was, I, was, I, was sitting, I was sitting behind somebody over here tonight, and this afternoon she was obviously alcoholic, talking to another alcoholic fellow, and she said, you know, if the, if... If, if we're the craze, if the normies, and she's pointing at me, <laughs> the normies call us crazy. <laughs> what do they, you know, something about, if they call us crazy, what do they What do they say about us in the meetings or something like that? And I said, we call you precious. <laughs> Give me a break. Anyway, um, uh, we have a tradition that says the only requirement for membership is that there's a problem of alcohol, alcoholism in a relative or friend. It does not say you have to know who the relative or friend is. <laughs> there is no qualifier except me. I qualify myself for Al-Anon. At several points in my life, all the alcoholics have left me. And I was crazier when they left me than I was when they were home. <laughs> They are not my problem. I am my problem. Uh, and so if, if you hear something in these lots of exposure to al you're getting this weekend, if you hear anything that sounds, makes sense to you, you belong. I don't know how alcoholics go to group, to, um, group conscience without going to al but I guess you figure it out. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, I, when I came to Al-Anon, I had very strong opinions about people being called Al-Anon. If you wanted to watch the hair on my neck stand up, you need to be in the room and some new alcoholic walks in the room and somebody says, oh, look, there's Bob, the new drunk. And there's Betty, his little Al-Anon wife, twitching in behind him because we tend to get here with a twitch. And um, she is not an Al-Anon because she's, she's twitching in behind him. She's an alligator. Yeah. Those are people who really ought to come to Al-Anon, and they don't come. They're snappy little people, you know, and they <laughs> you can't ever please them. You know, they got a lot of rules, black and white, black and white, black and white. But they're alligators. I'm not an Al-Anon because of the other people in my life. I'm an Al-Anon because I have a 12-step, 12 tradition, 12 concept program that I practice like my life depends on it. I am convinced today of the fatal nature of my disease. You know who uses the insurance first in an alcoholic home? The, the non-alcoholic. Alcoholics have blessed moments of blackout. Not us. We're awake and paying attention. Some of us, you may have heard, are even taking notes. <laughs> We're writing on the calendar, drunk, smiley-faced. <laughs> I hate to tell you, I was doing that when I came to al because he wouldn't come home for two or three nights at a time. And, I, and he'd finally come home, and I'd go, where have you been? <laughs> and, you know, he would say, what are you talking about? You haven't been home in two nights. He's, I sure have. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? <laughs> so I started keeping a little notebook. Really, because I started to believe him. I thought, I'm, make, I'm losing my head here. So I started a little notebook. What night he came home, what condition he was in when he came home, how quickly he went to bed, how many times I fixed dinner before he came home, you know, because sometimes, anyway, that's way all over there. Anyway, I'm an Al-Anon 
because I have a committed meeting that I go to every week like a doctor's appointment. If you want to find me, you come Monday night at 6.15 to the Addison, Texas, Al-Anon family group meeting, and that's where I'll be. Some nights I'm Zooming, some nights I'm rooming. It's just the way it goes. It's just the way it goes. It's just the way it goes, but I'm there. And uh, it's the same on the Zoom as it is in the room. Uh, I walk in the room. God, back when it was all full and we weren't divided like we are now, but we walk back, I walk in the room and they go, Oh, Ellen, there you are. I felt so welcome. I felt so loved. And all I did was walk in the room, you know, and I was accepted exactly as I was. I'm an Alanon because I have a sponsor. <laughs> And she knows she's my sponsor. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think we need a little checklist in al Do you have a sponsor? Does she know she's your sponsor? <laughs> we do this whole thing about, well, I don't want to bother her. <laughs> if somebody agreed to be your sponsor, they agreed to be bothered. <laughs> Let them be in charge of their boundaries. It's good practice. I'm an Al-Anon, and I'm so grateful there is such a thing as Al-Anon to be. When I was 17, Mama diagnosed me. Mama diagnosed me as boy crazy, <laughs> and she could have a point there, but if the place she sent me to be safe was Lubbock, Texas. Well, I'm just telling you, in 1963 in Lubbock, Texas, where she sent me, the ratio of boys to girls was seven to one. <laughs> Throw me in the briar patch, right? <laughs> oh, make me go there. Well, I went looking for him, because I was always looking for him. I always had a him, because you couldn't be himless, but I mean, look at him. <laughs> so I always had my bag packed, you know, waiting for the next him to come along. Didn't take me long to find him. I think it was maybe six months, and I found him. Oh, I remember the moment it happened. <laughs> Well, of course, he was married and had two kids and was 60 pounds overweight. But none of that seemed insurmountable to me. You know? I never liked the easy ones. You know, the ones who go, oh, you're so cute. Can I have a... No, get away. I want the ones you have to fight for. The ones you have to earn. You know, the ones you have to make love you. <laughs> We could do it again, couldn't we? Huh? It wears me out just thinking about it, but it does give me a rush. <laughs> I don't know what I do with them. <laughs> well, I, have to must, I must confess to you, he was not drinking when I married him. <laughs> oh, no, when we started dating, he was drinking shortly. And I actually think that must have been a rule of the first wife, that there was no drinking, and that was the reason he wasn't drinking. But for me, honey, whatever you want. I'm used to heavy drinkers. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm my family, it's a family of heavy drinkers. That's just what they did. I thought that was the way you lived. Um, they acted as if there was something the matter with people who didn't drink. You should stay away from them. They're fanatics. Some of them are Baptists. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not what they said, but my hearing has nothing to do with what you said. <laughs> I hear what I think you're going to say or what I'm afraid you might say. That's what I hear. <laughs> we were married six months when he hit me the first time. He was drunk when he hit me. He was drunk every time he hit me. I did not grow up in a family where adults hit each other. So the reaction I had to that wasn't anything anybody taught me. I thought it up all by myself in my fabulous little solution center right here in my brain. My sponsor told me one time, she said, you know, the trouble in your life is not the problem. <laughs> your solutions are the problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the best thing I could think to do was double dog dare him to do it again. I thought it was a power move. Turns out, nope, just insanity all over again. And it didn't take any more insanity on his part to hit me the second time than it did the first time. And that's the way we lived, because I will make my bed and I will damn near die in it. My mother had told me if I married him, she was going to disown me. Oh, you got to marry him, if that's what she says. And I wasn't going to admit that it was a, it might possibly be a mistake. Uh, I can't tell you when this happened, but at, and I couldn't tell you until Al-Anon what happened, but I can tell you today what happened. 
every time he hit me and I believed what he said, which was if I hadn't done what I did, he wouldn't have, have to do what he did. Every time he hit me and I believed what he said, which was you deserve that. Every time he hit me and I got up the next morning, I looked in the mirror at a black eye or a split lip or a bloody nose and I said to myself, it's not that bad. That's the Al-Anon death knell. It's not that bad. My sponsor told me early on, she said, you deserve better than the worst thing you can stand. But I will do. It's not that bad. I can do this. It's not that bad. Every time I did that, a piece of me left and another piece and another piece and another piece until nine years later, there was nobody left who could stand up and say, you can't treat me like that. So nine years later, I left. And you can guess why. Another guy came along. <laughs> yeah. And he was perfect. And he said, he said, you don't have to live like that anymore. Well, you know, and I'm like, okay, got you. Don't need you. I had the power to move because I had hold of that one over here. He was a dream boat. I had made a list in my head of what the perfect man would be like. And um, he, he was the list. He was the list. He was the right height, the right age, the right coloring, the right job. If I, as long as I worked 40 hours a week, he had a great job. His family was lovely, a little uh, entwined with him, but they, you know, they're like 45 minutes away, so they wouldn't be stopping over, you know, so that was okay. Um, but he was, you would have loved him. You would have loved him. Um, and sure enough, a year later, we got married because I'm like the Mounties. I always get my man. And, um, and off we went, you know. And um, he had one little tiny problem, one little fault, and that was that he didn't come home nights. <laughs> but, you know, I'm thinking a couple of home-cooked meals and a little, you know, and I got him. <clears throat> Back in the day, that's how I made, uh, marked my territory, you know, right there. <laughs> And so for like six months, it couldn't have been that long, but in my, in my delusional brain, it was six months, he came home every night. And I was pretty sure I must be doing everything right because he came home every night. And then the night came, he didn't come home. Now, I didn't realize I was dealing with a subset of alcoholics I had never dealt with before, which was the bar drinking variety that is addicted to the place and the people in it as they are to the substance alcohol. But that's what he was. And he didn't come home. Dinner was he, dinner was ready, and he wasn't home. So I lay on the floor of the bathroom, and I cried. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure he saw the two pounds I gained, and that's why he didn't love me anymore, and that's why I wasn't coming home. And then I thought, stupid, stupid me this morning. He said, what's for dinner? And I said, roast beef. What was I thinking? Everybody knows pork chops are his favorite thing. So I made a promise to myself that from then on, whenever he asked what was for dinner, I was always going to say pork chops. And then when he got home, I could tell him the truth and lock the door. And then I decided what I really needed to do was I needed to go sit on the sofa and wait. If you're in training for al you must pass waiting 101. And the way you know you're in waiting 101 is if when you're waiting, you can't do anything else. You can't talk on the phone. You can't watch TV. You can't read a book. You can't do the laundry. The kids would come up and they'd go, Mom. And I'd go, shh. I'm waiting. <laughs> and that's because when I'm waiting, I'm listening. I'm listening for the sound of those tires. 44 bazillion other tires on the planet don't care. I could pick mine out in a mall parking lot. And I had the same reaction to the sound of tires as I've heard an alcoholic say a drink did for them. I would hear the tires and I'd go, ah, he's home. Everything's going to be okay. You might have to kill him when he walks in the door, but at least he would die at home. And I decided I didn't want to be divorced anymore, that perhaps a widow was the way to go. And, um, you know, when I was new in Allen, I landed. My first meeting was November 3rd in 1981. And I walked into an Allen on group that believed in the big book. There was no edict handed down at that point that said only we could only read things written by Allen ons. And uh, they were big book people which is why I'm here with you, because <laughs> me too. Um, and they had a, a pattern that they did every week. They went to two Al-Anon meetings and one open AA meeting every week. That was what they did. 
I'm so grateful for open AA meetings. As much as Al-Anon has saved my life, AA made it make sense. When I listen to an alcoholic I'm not emotionally involved with yet, um, I, um, it's an iffy proposition always. Um, I had to tell Miha today that it was not a good sign, but I really wanted to take him home. <laughs> oh, so good. Anyway, when I could listen to that, I finally began to hear where the man stopped and the disease started. I finally began to understand the difference between can't and won't. And, uh, and now one thing I heard in those meetings, and, you know, 99 times out of 100, they always went home. It might be that day or the next week or three years later, but they always went home. And that's what happened with mine. He came home. He was two hours late and drunk, but he came home. And I met him at the door like a three-year-old who's been crying all afternoon, and you've said, stop it. Who was that that? <laughs> and you know when your eyes are all swollen and the snot slinging in the room? I think about that, and I think, no wonder he drank. You know, if that's waiting at home, I'll have another. Um, and I asked the second stupidest question we can ask. The first is, have you been drinking? The second stupidest is, where have you been? See, I, I suspect some of you, maybe not all of you, but you have the same gift, talent, curse, whatever you want to call it as I do. Um, my head makes up stories without me. It just makes up stories. They're never pleasant. They're always sad. Somebody is always suffering, and it's always me in my head. <laughs> and it, it does it without me asking. It just goes right on off there, and the next thing you know, I'm in horror land because of what my head's done. And I can't tell you exactly what happened that first night he didn't come home, but I'll bet you it's something like what I'm going to tell you. Um, in my head, it said, oh, my God, he's, he's driven his car out in the country. I don't know why. And now look, the car's blown up. I don't know why. The car just blew up. Blew his body in a ditch by the road. Cars are going by, but I can't see him because he's in a ditch by the road. He's dying, but he's not quite dead yet. <laughs> and with his dying breath, he's calling me. <coughs> Ellen, I love you. <coughs> animals are coming and tearing off body parts and strewing them in the forest and it'll be seven years before we can identify the body. That's what my head does. <laughs> I told that in a place some years ago and it was a, at a hotel and it was a big room and the you know, and I'm looking at the doors out there and this guy was about this big walking by and they left the doors open. Earth people are walking by out there and he goes by and he comes back and he looks at me. <laughs> He's going to go 911, call 911. No, sorry, we're all like that. Um, so when I asked him, where have you been, there was only one acceptable answer. In a ditch bleeding. Everything else was going to hurt my feelings. And that's what, you know, we tend to come to Alan on one of two ways. We either come in angry or we come in hurt. I came in hurt. Everything, it's the same it's the same feeling. It's just whether you suck it in on yourself or you blow it out on other people. I sucked it in on me. And uh, uh, it hurt. Everything hurt. So when, I, when I was new in Al-Anon, that was the only feeling I had was hurt. And um, I had a sponsor. Oh, my God, I wanted to please her. People please and saved my life till it started to make my life small. People please and saved my life. I wanted her to like me. I wanted you to like me. I wanted so badly to stay with you. You were happy. I hadn't been happy like that in the longest time. And you had your own minds and your own thoughts. and your, You had a life. I wanted a life. And so one day I realized I had a new feeling. I could hardly wait to tell her. I called her up. I said, I have a new feeling. She said, quick, what is it? And I said, fear. <laughs> She said, really? What are you afraid of? And I'm like, is that necessary? <laughs> you have to like nail it down to something because I'm just, I'm just like afraid all the time. I'm just afraid all the time. <laughs> but I'm in a sponsor line that believes you should chase root fears to their root cause, that they rarely are what you think they are. There's something underneath that and maybe something underneath that. You need to go to root cause. And she always said, my sponsor today, 
I'll stay on the phone while you talk it out. I process with my mouth open. It's not a good thing. It makes you go on and on and on and on. Um, somebody asked me the other day if I'd heard of the new 12-step group called On and On and On. <laughs> and no. Mm. I came into Al-Anon in 1981 when treatment centers were coming into the vogue. And we were getting a lot of treatment center people in our meetings. And they were speaking treatment center not elegant. And it would make the old timers in the room, you know, they'd go, <coughs> they'd start with, <laughs> the one that really made their eyes roll back in their head was, I'm dealing with my inner child. And they're like, <coughs> <laughs> where is that in the book? <laughs> but what I heard there, I told her, I said, I, I've heard, I know what it is. I said, I have fear of abandonment. I'm afraid he's going to leave me. She said, really? Why? And I said, well, he said he's going to leave. <laughs> she said, really? When is he going? <laughs> Friday. <laughs> he said, he's leaving Friday. She said, honey, let me tell you something. The way to tell whether or not an alcoholic is leaving you is if he's gone. <laughs> she taught me to turn off the sound and look at the picture. She said, the sound will confuse you. <laughs> he means well. He cannot follow through. Watch his feet. Don't read his lips. She said, okay, well, let's just say he leaves you. Now, how are you? How do you feel? I said, I'm more afraid than ever. And this sounds like it should take the maybe two minutes it's going to take me to tell you, but I bet it took a week. I said, I'm afraid he's going to leave me. I'm afraid if he leaves me, he's going to leave me in a position I have avoided my entire life alone alone with two kids, really alone. I don't want to be alone. I'm terrified to be alone. She said, why are you so afraid of being alone? And I, and I knew that it was attached to this sensation I got in the back of my head sometimes. And I, I know now it was just a feeling that I had stuffed down so long and it was so big and I'd feel it. I, can, I, can re I can't remember exactly the feeling. Boy, I remember my reaction to it when it would start. And I would just almost physically push it down. And, I, and so with her help, I talked through that. And what it was was um, that feeling that would come up said, you're not enough. And you're never going to be enough. Not tall enough, pretty enough, rich enough, thin enough, smart enough, nothing enough. You are not enough. And I, my fear was if I'm not enough, I'm not going to be able to take care of myself, much less my two kids. And if, I'm not, if I can't take care of myself, I'll die. And that's the way it went. If that's sort of a little kid fear, if they're, you know, they're, if I'm, if I don't have the people I need, um, you know, I'll be, die, I'll die. Um, uh, so, what the, but the, I don't know why this is so, blah, blah, blah. but anyway, um, when somebody said I love you to me, what I heard was I won't leave you. I won't leave you. So when this new guy said I love you and you don't have to live like that. And he was willing to divorce his wife. <laughs> oh, I'm consistent, if nothing else. <laughs> um, you know what? I've, I've just thinking this. I was thinking about this today. Something somebody said. I, I'm sure it must have been John Paul, who said uh, maybe it wasn't. I could be putting words in your mouth, but boy, that would be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, Anyway, I, I won't go there. You've already heard that. It's on the tape. You can listen. I have time. I have to go. There's things to do. We've got a fire to have here in a minute. Um, so anyway, so uh, we rocketed off into, you know, so I'm married to him. Now he doesn't come home nights. Now it's about five years later, six years later, still not coming home nights. It's getting worse, not getting better. And... Uh, I'm in, uh, and so I, so a parent called school and she was crying. Now, if you want to watch an alligator go crazy, put us in the room, an alligator, somebody not now and on yet, put him in the room with somebody who's crying because the primary alligator illusion is when you're okay, then I'll be okay. And I got to do everything in my power to make you okay. I will make you okay whether you want to be or not. I will make you so okay you leave me. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, when somebody's crying, it's like all the alarms go off. Oh my God, we gotta get over there, we gotta help them. We have a deal in my Al Anon group. We have, we have Kleenex boxes all around the tables. Somebody cries in every Al Anon meeting. Sometimes they cry because they hurt. Sometimes they cry because they're relieved. Sometimes they cry and they don't know why they're crying. I think they just have tear deaths. They've held tears back that they needed to cry, and they just cry. But we have a deal. We don't shove the Kleenex box at them. It's a very subtle way of saying, your tears are bothering me, dry them up. The fact is, that table has been cried on, snotted on, everything else. We clean it every month, you know. <laughs> and, uh, can't have, can't have everything. <laughs> we don't have professional care there. Um, let them cry. My, my sponsor told me one day, she said, maybe the best thing we do for each other is we attend each other's pain. We don't tell each other. If you just get a, a better attitude, we'll let you come to another meeting. Or if you wipe that look off your face, we'll let you share. Because nothing would make my mother madder than when she'd say, wipe that look off your face. And I'd go, <laughs> Why did you get in all that trouble? I don't know. Um, so she called school. She was crying. I'm trying to fix her. She says, um, my husband is, is in a program for his alcoholism, and, and as part of that, we're going to pay the school back the money we owe him, but I just want you to know it'll take a while. And I lied to her. I said, my husband drinks too much, too. The problem was not his drinking. I'm used to people drinking. But he wasn't coming home, and I thought that was a direct reflection on what kind of wife I was. If I was a better wife, he'd be coming home. If I could move the TV two inches this way, maybe he'd be happier. Maybe if the kids were quieter, or if the house was cleaner, or I served pork chops every night, maybe then he'll come home. I lied to her. And I didn't know I was lying to somebody brand new in Al-Anon, and she just, she was on fire. And they didn't tell her she shouldn't track, track me down. She called me, and she'd say, oh, you ready to go to me? Oh, no, my grandmother's sick. I, I remember that summer. I lied all summer long about why I couldn't go to Al-Anon. And I ended up in Al-Anon anyway. And she drove me to my first, first six meetings because she had this sense to know that I wouldn't take myself if she didn't come pick me up. So she picked me up and she took me. And uh, I landed in a nest of winners. The thing about winners in AA, I don't know about AA, but I suspect it. But I know in Al-Anon is um, some days I'm the winner and some days you're the winner. You know, we trade off. There aren't some days I'm, all, I'm always the winner and you're always the winner. This doesn't work like that here. So anyway, I end up in Al-Anon, and I'm loving it. And then two and a half years later, I'm diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm 38 years old, too young, no history of it in my family. Um, there were studies then that said that stress, uh, cancer was a, could be a stress-related disease. Al-Anon's, um, the families of alcoholics have all sorts of stress-related diseases. The, um, in my in my experience, and it could be because I am the one who had cancer, and, and people tend to come to me who've had cancer, and so we, I, I can almost tell you in the meeting who's who has and who hasn't. It's an an, an, an awfully high ratio. Um, uh, uh, this is the place where I usually apologize. <laughs> I'm not apologizing to you though. Um, when I my I'm not gonna have to when um. I was sponsored by the grand sponsee of a woman who ended up being my sponsor for 15 years. She came into program in 1954 in Midland, Texas, when there was no program to come into. She walked into open AA meetings with her husband. And um, she absolutely loved how it felt in the rooms. And she said, I want what you have. And I love alcoholic women. They saved her life and they saved mine. And they said, come on, we'll take you through the steps. He didn't care whether she drank or didn't drink. They took her through the steps, through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what she did with us. I've hung my life on a couple of lines out of the big book. One of them is nothing but nothing happens by mistake in God's world. And I know that's Dr. Paul's story way off the other end of the page 164, way off there. But um, that's when I, when I heard that the first time, I thought, that's the God I want. I want a God who can make miracles happen out of horrors. I want, I want a God that Mr. Rogers used to talk about. Mr. Rogers would say when there's a catastrophe, look for the helpers. Watch the helpers. And, the, and, and that's what AA and Al Anon tell me. Look at the people who do service. Look at the people who help. That's where our life is. Not in the horror of it all. That's just planet Earth. You know, that's what happens when you're a breathing human being. Um, and the other one is the last column of the four-step inventory that 
inventory that basically says, oh, what was your part? I recognize it doesn't say part. I do realize that there may be the word mistake in there. But if I had read mistake, I never would have done it because I worked very hard at making no mistakes. But the first time I did an inventory and it said, what was, and I read, what was your part? It was the first time I realized I have a part in everything that happens in my life. There are some places where I'm helpless victim and other places I have a part. I have a part. Even if it's something that happened to me when I was a little child and it shouldn't happen to little children and I didn't know what happened and I didn't know who to tell but I knew it was bad and I knew I shouldn't say anything. I didn't tell anybody. I, don't, I wouldn't allow myself to remember it until I came to Al-Anon. And what I found out was if I want to be free, I'm the one who can do the work and be free. That's my part. That's my part. So when I was diagnosed with breast cancer and they gave me a 60-40 chance of living another five years, I only knew one thing to do, and that was steps. You know, every time we hit a, a, a life lesson, little ones, big ones, we have two choices. We can lean into the program or we can pull away. Hopefully, you've built up some momentum and your tendency will be to lean in instead of pull back. But I leaned in. It was breathing life into me. And I got in a step study with other women. And they did the steps on them. I did the steps on when the tumor was growing in me because I wanted to know. Um, you treated me like my life was valuable. The word you used in step two was restore, which is what you do to something of value. It doesn't say beat back into shape or melt it down into something else. It says restore. I'm not being restored to any place I ever was before in my life. I'm being restored to God's vision of the possible me. And the possible me grows every day. I'm, I think, I think I, God's even surprised at how good I'm turning out. <laughs> Um, and what I came to understand when I did the steps was uh, I can't, I break out in malignancies when I live in active alcoholism. I'm not spiritual. I wasn't spiritually fit then, and I don't know that I could do it today to live in, in active alcoholism. So for the 40 millionth time I told him, but for the first time I meant it, if you can't stay sober, you can't stay here. For the first time, my life was valuable to me, and I was standing up for my life. Um, he finally left, and if he, if you ask him, he would tell you it was that crazy daughter of mine that anyone had to live with her would drink too. She made me want to drink. She made me want to leave home, but um, she made me want to drink. She was just, and I came to find out not so very long after that that the spring I started chemotherapy, she was in the eighth grade, and she started drugs and alcohol. She turned overnight into this. She went from a beige and navy blue little girl to this hot pink neon orange head-banging thing that um, lived over the edge of the planet someplace. Strangest friends in all the world. Um, and I really couldn't focus on her. I was very busy saving my own life at the moment, which was a blessing at the time. She got to do whatever it was she needed to do. Um, she ended up in some trouble at school. I still don't know what happened. She said, I can't go back there. Take your word for it. You can't go back there. You got to get in another school. She was a mid-semester junior. Anyway, she ended up coming to the school where I worked, and the people there knew, had known her since she was five years old. And it took them two weeks, and they said, we've, uh, we've talked about that. There's something the matter with her. <laughs> and they said, we're going to send her for an evaluation. Uh, three days later, the guy calls from the treatment center, and he says, Miss, Miss Davis, hate to tell you this, but we do believe your daughter's alcoholic. And I'm like, yes. And he says, huh. Not had a lot of moms react like that. You know? And I'm like, I thought she was crazy. That's an Al-Anon symptom. No sign she'll ever get over for that. But alcoholism, yes, 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 yes. I know what to do. See, we have a thing. We have a thing in Al-Anon where we talk about enabling. We don't want to enable, and where's the enabling line? Well, I'll tell you, I, don't, I think the only person I enable when I do that is myself. Because I do for them because I'm afraid of how I'll feel if something bad happens to them. And I do for them, and I do for them, and I do for them. And literally, we can help you. I'm not kidding. Help you to death. We've done it before. Um, so, but there's another thing. 
it's not sort of an unwritten thing, a mom thing. That's just my experience here. Moms tend to have to do everything they can think of for their kid before they can let go. And I had to do everything I could think of my kid. And she was 17, so I could make her do stuff. <laughs> ah, I made her. I took her to an outpatient treatment center that would force feed the steps into her and take her to Al-Anon meetings. And it was great. And she stayed sober about a year and a half. It was all my fault. She was alcoholic. I don't care why she's alcoholic. I don't care. I don't care if she thinks it's my fault. I'm just so glad she's going to the meetings. And, and uh, uh, her idea of anonymity um, was always for a very long time not telling anybody that I was her mother. Anyway, she did not see me as a rock star. <laughs> she saw me as a big mouth. <laughs> she stayed sober about a year and a half, and uh, and then she went back out. And she stayed out uh, a little while longer. She came back in uh, January 29th of uh, 1990. And uh, she, was, she got sober twice before it was ever legal for her to drink once. She didn't do drugs, except that they were easier to get at school than the liquor, but she really is an alcoholic. My children are adopted, and some years back, she did they, she did a DNA test, and she called me up. She said, you're not going to believe it. I don't have markers for anything except one thing. The only thing I have markers for are alcoholism. There's two possible markers, and I have both of them. She said, there's nothing I could have been but alcoholic. So that was when it stopped being my fault. Um, anyway. She, um, in that year and a half that she was sober the first time, she started hanging out in slippery places with slippery people. And I, the sense I had is she's going to start drinking, and if she drinks, I'll die. So for the empty umpth time I said it, for the first time I meant it, if you can't go by the rules of the house, you cannot stay here. And I planned the day. The day I planned for, for her eviction was um, the day I was leaving to go to Crested Butte, Colorado, to the Crested Butte Mountain Conference with 600 of my closest friends because I didn't want to kick my daughter out. I love off my daughter. I wanted her happy, healthy, home and whole, and she couldn't do any of that. And that morning, while I'm back in the car, she throws herself across my bed, and she says, Mom, you're going to be a grandma. She said later, she thought it was a cute way to tell me, I thought she was making me the responsible party again. You're going to be a grandma. That's what I heard. And it was ugly for a little bit there. I don't know what, I don't know what, I, I'm so grateful I don't remember what I said, but I remember feeling every time I opened my mouth, that's ugly. So finally I picked up the phone and called my sponsor and turned myself in. <laughs> and um, she said, do you want her to stay? I said, honestly, I don't. I, she wears me out. I can't do it. I can't. She said, honey, if you don't want her to stay, I'll stay on the phone while you tell her. And she said, there are only so many bad feelings in every relationship. Those are her bad feelings. Let her have them. I take on other people's feelings. I do it without thinking. But those when I my side of the street was clean. This was her life that was a mess, not mine. And I um, And it quit hurting so much. I always thought the pain was in letting go, but the pain is not in letting go. The pain is in holding on when it's time to let go. And it was time to let go of that child. And I ran to Crested Butte and ran right to my sponsor and cried and cried and cried and cried because I didn't want to kick her out. And now she's pregnant. Months go by. She's telling people what a bad mom I am. She's pregnant. I won't let her come live at home. I'm going out telling people my I love the tapers. I'm so sorry that... Um, he didn't get to come this year because I really love those people. I love them all. I love all the tapers. I like them because you get them trapped behind the table and they can't go anywhere. And you can just talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, you know. Um, I trapped my friend Buddy behind the table when Melissa was pregnant, and I said, she's pregnant at me now. <laughs> because it's, it's all about me. It's all about me, you know. And he said, honey, you know what? I understand how you feel, but he said our, our son's girlfriend had a baby out of wedlock, and the child has been the light of our lives. Never occurred to me I might like it. I love babies. I have loved babies my whole life. I can't get enough babies. I have three. I have a, a number of great, great grandchildren, but there's only three of them I can get my hands on. And um, I have a 10-month-old one. Oh, my God. She is edible. She is just edible. I was talking to her, her mother on the phone the other day, and I hear this sound going on. I said, what is that? 
she said that mom, she said Mimi this ch- this baby will do everything except spin her head around <laughs> she and I are going to go good together and God was offering me a baby and I was doing the thing that I do in my disease and said yeah but yeah but God not like this not today not her this is not the way this is supposed to happen God I can't like this it's like telling God when you look at a sunset that's pretty good but I could have used a little more purple over there a little less over here you know Alanon has taught me to go from yeah but to thank you Clint Hodges used to say that acceptance was thank you God for everything exactly as it is I wouldn't change a thing now I'll argue with that today because there are things I would change and there are some things that um, in my community that are my responsibility to do something about, I feel like, but thank you, God, for everything exactly as it is. And I decided to say thank you for the baby. Thank you for the baby, God. And so she called me up and she said, Mom, I know you knit in a blue blanket. Knit faster. They did a sonogram. It's twin boys. You know, alcoholics, if one's good, let's have another. (laughs) The second baby made all the difference in the world. If she had one baby, you'd have another speaker, I guarantee you. But she had what an order baby. And all he had to be was number two to be what an order. Um, So... They get born. I fall in love with heartbeats in the hospital, just listening to their little hearts. I'm just in love madly before they ever show up in the world. And um, I told her that she could come live with me after she had the baby. She didn't like dolls. I don't know what the heck she's going to do with twin babies. And she's 18 years old. I don't know. So I said, you can come live with me to get the hang of twins. What is that? When 14, 15, maybe? <laughs> um, <laughs> When they were five weeks old, she called me at work one day and she said, Hey, Mom, um, I'm not going to keep them. You can have them if you want them. Did I tell you I was in love with heartbeats, you know, and now they had faces. Uh, it was a difficult summer, and um, I, I, one day I was keeping them, the next day I was giving them up. Every reason I had for keeping them was about me. Every reason I had for giving them up was about them. And uh, I called my sponsor, and she said... She'd been trying to tell me for years that God wanted for me. I'm gonna put this down. For sake. Um, that I that God wanted for me what what I wanted in my heart of hearts. That's too bad about that. I'll do my level best. So much story, so little time. Um, and I told her I was afraid. I, I don't know what I don't know what I really want. I'm afraid to make that decision. What if I pick something and then next week something better comes and I can't have it because I picked the stupid thing last week. So then I just don't make a decision. I let you make it and then blame me when it doesn't work out. <laughs> and she said, honey, God is not a terrorist waiting around the corner to test your patience. God really wants you happy, joyous, and free. God's promise to you, if you turn it over, is this or something better. This or something better. So I went to adoption agencies and I said, I'm looking for a family that wants two babies and a grandmother. <laughs> did not want to I did not want to give up the grandmother thing there's some babies there's some babies here and uh it took five months to find them the babies were five months old and they this uh, adoption agency let me pick the surrender day and I picked the day I was going back to Christy Butte to be with 600 of my closest friends it was the toughest it was up to that day the toughest day of my life they cried the babies cried I cried and I cried for a year. I'm just telling you, I cried for a year. Um, but they were the family who kept me as grandma. And they let my daughter see him whenever she wanted. She, for a long time, she didn't want to see him as much as I wanted to see him. And, and um, uh, until, and high school was a little dicey with them because they started going to public high school. And I'm, they didn't want to know about the fam- about the alcoholism. They didn't want to know that these are the children of two addicts. And the odds are really not really good here. Um, and so when they graduated from high school, they lived 75 miles north of Dallas because my daughter hoped that maybe there was no alcoholism there. <laughs> and um, the paper wasn't dry on their diplomas before they were in Dallas. Yeah, and my husband, and there was another husband, you know there would be, and I don't have time, I wish you could, because he was the, <laughs> he was the prince, if you want to know, just ask me, they can tell you, they met him, he was just the prince, he was the best thing ever, he was, he, oh, anyway, he was, 
anyway. Um, uh, so what he, his idea of supporting our children and grandchildren when they were out in the world working was they were all working in you know, fast food restaurants or restaurants someplace, and we'd go, and he'd say, what's the best thing on the menu? And they, of course, would always pick the most expensive thing, and he would always buy it. And then he would, like, double the tip, you know, so they would, like, make a million dollars in one night or something. So we were out, Anthony, the older twin, was working, and we were out there with him, and he said, yeah, we, he, 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 we had just, Melissa had been talking to him about alcoholism. And uh, he said, I don't know what the big deal is. i got beer in my refrigerator. I can take it or leave it. He was 19. At the time he was 22, he was in prison. He had five alcohol-related offenses at that point. Um, one of them was dr- walking drunk in downtown Dallas. How drunk do you have to be <laughs> to get picked up by the Segway cops, for heaven's sake? <laughs> anyway, it was not his last time in prison, I must add. Um, and from here on, the story is harder to tell, so have patience with me. Um, I married, I did marry again. I stayed, I decided to be single for a long time, it seems like to me. It could have been like four minutes, but no, I think it was like eight years I was single. Because I'd never been single before, and I wanted to be single. And then I wanted to, I wanted to see if I could be me in a relationship. And I was just going to practice on this one guy, because he wasn't in the program. I'm not marrying anybody who's not in the program. I've already seen what happens there. I, I need a guy... You're my people. I'm hanging out with you, so he's going to have to be right in there. So I'm just practicing on this guy. He is funny. He's bright. You know, he's easy. The um, whole dating thing was, poof, we dated for like five years. Not my usual. And um, uh, he was drinking. <laughs> anyway, upshot of it is we got married I married him. I married him in uh, the day after Thanksgiving in 1992, and my sponsor married us. And my parents were there, and my brothers and sisters were there. It was a real live wedding. We went on a real live honeymoon. I had a real live engagement. It was just perfect. Everything was perfect. It was a little drinking. Um, it took him two years to catch alcoholism. He says that he dated his way into Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and probably that's what happened to him. But he hung out with you. And one of my dear friends in AA, I said something to him about blah, 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 blah. And he was like a dog on point. It was all he needed to know about him. Boom. And he hunted him down until the guy said, okay, 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 I'm an alcoholic. And um, I'm married to a, I was married to a sober guy. It was the best ever. Best ever. Um, Melissa came back in, when she came back in that January uh, of 1990, she stayed sober. I can't tell you exactly. I do not know where she slipped. I only know where she fell. She came back in. um, She married. She had got two degrees, had two more little boys that she kept and raised, and and, uh, they divorced, and she married an AA guy, and they were, they were, um, Mr. and Ms. AA, you know, they had the big house, people, 250 people out there three times a year, big AA parties, all great. And she's slowly but surely, something's going on with her. And she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Remember, she's adopted at 39. Um, so there may be a stress-related thing going on here. And uh, But it was nothing. It was she, The only reason she had the mammogram was because she had a sponsee who was afraid to do it. And she said, I'll do it too. You just have to see it's not that scary. Sponsee didn't have anything. My daughter did. And uh, so what happened was she did all the rebuilding stuff, and she had a very high tolerance for drug and alcohol, very low tolerance for pain. It's not a good combination. And she wouldn't let anybody else dose the pills, and she took the pills. And that was the beginning. She got addicted to the pain pills. And eventually she's off the pain pills, and she's back to booze because my daughter was an alcoholic. She was an absolute alcoholic. She tried for seven or eight years to get sober again. Went back into treatment at one point, and they told me there, I put her into treatment. My husband and I did, um, because I'd never put her in inpatient before. Um, They said the chance of somebody with long-time sobriety slipping and then um, ever getting long-time sobriety again is very small. And she, she didn't. She couldn't. The cancer came back. She, by that time, had no job. The husband was done with her. He evicted her. We went, my, hus- my husband said, in the summer of um, 2013, he said, we need to go get those boys. The police were being called out there. It was just awful. 
So we went and got the boys. They were 13 and 15, and they came to live with us. In October of 2013, the younger twin, the second one, Mr. Made All the Difference, killed himself driving drunk in a one-vehicle accident. The parents were devastated. They kept asking the policeman, what happened, what happened? He said, alcohol and speed, alcohol and speed. That's what happened. Um, my daughter the next week attempted suicide again. She had talked suicide since she was six years old. Uh, so, so that's 2013. So it's going downhill, downhill, downhill. She's working really hard trying to get sober. Can't stay sober. Going to meetings like crazy. She's loved by AA. They're doing their dead level best. But she's, she's who she is. And then in uh, September of 2016, the older twin, uh, who already had been in prison before, went back again for too, too many DWIs. And they put him into a judicial treatment center, hoping he could catch alcoholism in prison. I don't believe it happened. He stayed, uh, he did a year, and then he came out, and he's done five years of probation, and he just got off probation in May, and I understand he's drinking. You know, I've learned in al -Anon, I love him. You know, I loved his heartbeat. I love him. I love him dearly. I've loved him for 33 years. But I can't get too close to him. I have to detach. I have to love him from a distance. The minute I need him to be different, I'm too close. I'm too close, and i got to back up. He knows I love him. He, he, the year that Cameron died, the younger twin, he gave me and my husband a, a Christmas card, and he said, I know that no matter where I go or what I do, you will love me. He said, you are the great, best grandparents ever. And he said, I know Cameron felt the same way. You know, that was the reason I gave them up was because I wanted them to have people. I wanted them to have grandparents. I wanted there to be somebody who loved them no matter what their grades were or what color their hair was or, you know, whether they brushed their teeth or cared about those kind of things. And that's what I, my goal was. And I'm telling you, that was God at work in my life to get that assurance back from him. He knows I love him. But I can't get close to him. i got to stay back. Um, he went to prison in September of 2013. And... And Melissa's cancer was apparently really bad. We weren't seeing much of her because she didn't want to come around the boys like she was, and we didn't want her coming around the boys like she was. When in January of 2017, she committed suicide. The year before, I had had a, I wish I could tell you the long story, but it's a long story. You can already tell I don't know any short ones. <laughs> um, she, had, she and I, had an interchange that we'd had a thousand times before, and I read something the next day, encouraged change, I believe it's like January 8th or 9th, and it said, um, the alcoholic she has a higher power of her own, and together they're perfectly capable of working out her future. The only thing you can do is love her, and come to think of it, it says, that's enough. It is so hard. It is so hard, but it's enough. And then the next thing I realized was, uh, I read another thing in another little book, and I realized that um, I, the pattern in those conversations we had wasn't hers. It was my pattern. One more time, it wasn't about her. It's about me. I was accusing her of not surrendering. You haven't surrendered. You've got to surrender. And then I realized, I'm the one who hasn't surrendered. I've been held captive to her threat of suicide since she was six years old. I have still held on to her, and I let go. And it was a physical thing. I could feel the let go. It was like I was letting go a piece of air, but it was let go. And when she died a year later, I was left with nothing but bottomless gratitude that somehow, some way, I got to be her mom. I don't know how that happened in God's green world. And such compassion. I cannot imagine how much pain she must have been in. Just the week before, someone had said, are you still thinking about suicide? And she said, I'd never do that to my boys. She loves those boys. All three of them. Three and a half. <laughs> Anthony went to prison in September of that same month. My husband was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Given four to six months to live. He died three and a half weeks after my daughter did. His death was very different. He was not alone in a car parked a house away from anybody he knew because there was 
the paper out that said he couldn't get close to that house. That's where Melissa was. She was a house away from her ex-husband. Um, he was in a hospice room where he had 24-hour-a-day visitation. He was in three 12-step programs by then. My program was, my, my family will just wrap you all up. And um, there were people from two different 12-step programs in the room with him when he died. For, um, it's still to this day, that's been five and a half years, and to this day, now that we're getting out of COVID and going, I'm going back seeing people again, inevitably when I'm in a place where there's a gathering of alcoholics, there'll be someone who comes to me and says, can you talk about Melissa? Can I talk about Melissa? Yes, please, talk about Melissa. And they'll say, can I tell you what she did for me when I was new sober? I wouldn't be here today if she hadn't been there for me. And what I've learned is there's a little light of Melissa that lives in all those people. I treasure them. And these people come to me and they say, do you ever sit next to your husband in a meeting? <laughs> yes. Always got in trouble, but yes, I did. And they'll say, you know, he always treated me like I was the only person in the room. He paid 100% attention to me. He was such a dear. I used to think that when I died and went to heaven, God was going to say, pull out the VCR and the tape because it's a very long time ago and let me see how her husband and her children turned out and if they turned out to be upstanding members of the community she's earned her way into heaven and she can come in I'm so grateful you let me find another God I don't it's another story I have in my head but my sponsor says I can have this story I think when I die when my body gets tired of doing whatever it's doing and that little part of me that's always been God's goes back to where God is I think when I get there God is going to go oh there you are. Why would God greet me with less love than you do? Why? And God's going to say, oh, precious, you know what? Heaven's heaven when you're not here, but it's just not perfect without you. <laughs> and he's going to say, i got three little questions. I've been running an experiment. It wasn't a test. You couldn't pass or fail. I just want to give us an experiment. I just wanted to see how it would go. First off, I want to know if you had a good time. I never did a single thing to torment you. There was no reason for flowers to be different colors, except I thought it'd make you smile. And I knew you'd love babies. I hope you got them all. Because of you, I'm going to be able to say, Ah, oh, yes, God, I had a great time at your party. Thanks for asking me. And the second thing he's going to say is, Were you, Ellen? You were the only one like that I made. I had things for you to do that nobody else could do. That question scared me because I'd spent so much of my time trying to be what I thought other people wanted me to be that I didn't know if I'd been me. So in my inventory at night for about three years, I handed a line that said, Today, Ellen. And I wrote down every day the one thing I did that day that I knew when I was doing it was mine to do. This was mine to do. You could have had another speaker and actually be done by now. But that's not what happened. <laughs> That's not what happened. This was mine to do. And after three years or so, I looked back at that and I read it. 96% of it was what you'd call service work. I knew when I was doing service work, I was exactly where God wanted me to be doing what God wanted me to do. And the last thing he's going to say is, precious girl, did you ever get the joke? <laughs> I, got the year, I got the joke the year of cancer. Standing at my back door with a 60-40 chance of living another five years. No hair. <laughs> Anywhere on my body. Um, I, and I had a little hat on because I couldn't wear wigs. It was too hot in the summer, so I had a little hat on. And I was getting ready to go out and buy some plants. And I started out the door, and I looked down and realized I was going to have to go back and shave my legs. <laughs> All the hair. We're talking eyelashes, eyebrows, other hair. But I don't know, still got it under my arms and on my legs. I had to go back and shave it off. That was the day I got the joke. That was the day I realized how much I have fought to hold on to things I think I have to have to be okay. And how much I fought to get things I thought I had to get to be okay. So hard. I missed now. I miss the fact that I have a higher power who prepares me for everything that's coming down the road. It's another reason I don't want to get in somebody else's spiritual path. I don't want to take any of their consequences away from them. I need them to, I want them to be on the direction, on the path God would have them be. There was a guy in our group that used to say the glass isn't half full or half empty. The glass is just too big. The difference here, what happens is somehow when I stand up here and pour, 
When I sit down, I'm the one whose heart overflows, and I thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.